My name is Peg Vershawn, and I am the Director of Programs at CURE, Clean Up the River Environment in Montevideo, Minnesota. Our shared goal with this series has been to amplify the stories of people who are using conservation practices and have important regenerative potential while reducing the impacts of climate change. These practices improve soil health and water quality. They grow deep connections to the land and those who came before them. These stories are from practitioners, people with boots on the ground and soil underneath their fingernails. Together, these storytellers are from different backgrounds, cultures, and generations. We're at a critical moment where we need to hear the perspectives of path builders who are catalyzing change in themselves and for their communities through the work that they're doing on the land. Today, we have Brian Simon from Lakeside Prairie Farm near Barrett, Minnesota. He's going to share with us how he and his family are blending their love of prairie, water, and farming into a viable livelihood. We will discuss the challenges of returning conventionally farmed land to a restored prey for grazing while caring for the land and the water. We'll explore Brian's experiences and education that led him and his family to take this leap, purchasing their own land and launching their family into this farming operation. We're going to begin with a brief introductory video. Hi, my name is Brian Simon. And welcome to Lakeside Prairie Farm. Uh, I farm with my wife, Jessie, and two kids, Charlie and Anella. And so this farm is a 217 acres, and it, what makes it unique is that it's got two miles of lake shoreline uh, around its perimeter. So it's a peninsula that sticks out into Cormorant Lake. We're in west central Minnesota, Barrett, Minnesota. And uh, so water is a big a big part of our lake or our farm and that's why we're called Lakeside Prairie Farm. And uh, then what sets us apart from the way we farm is that I've taken uh, some prime crop ground. So uh, corn and beans were historically uh, recently recent historic uh, we grown here. When we got here, that's what was here, uh, corn and beans, and we've taken that uh, 160 uh, of the farm's eight tillable acres and converted to native prairie. So high diversity native prairie, like a hundred and some species of native plants that we've planted as as pasture, and we we graze uh, cattle and goats. So I got into farming because of my love of the prairie. I, I, I got in a little different than most farmers. Uh, I wanted to manage prairie and I came to recognize the, some of the problems that agriculture had, especially uh, the impact that agriculture has on the native prairie. And I wanted to manage prairie in a way that can produce food all the while uh, maintaining the biodiversity of the prairie. Well, welcome. Uh, I don't know what it's like up in your neck of the woods, but the sun is shining down here. It's a little windy, but it's warm. Ah. And <laughs> is it hot? <laughs> it's more than warm. Okay, it was warm when I came in this morning, but it's it's supposed to be a gorgeous day before we get hit with a little bit more precipitation again tomorrow. So depending where you're at in the state, where you're viewing from, you might get rain and uh, you might even get some of the S word, the snow. So um but I want to thank Brian for joining us today. Uh, Brian has been um, part of our We Are Water West Central Minnesota project in a variety of ways over the past year. And when we decided to do this sharing stories um, video series, we thought that 
we couldn't do it without him because he uh, brings a lot of uh, rich texture to this series. He's um, doing some amazing work up in his part of the state, as well as being an alum from the University of Minnesota. And um, so welcome, Brian. Thank you. Um, I think we're going to start uh, off today with the, the big question is uh, that people wonder about when they want to convert their land from um, conventional farming to prairie. What are some of the challenges um, in building soil health that you went through through this transition um, to get your prairie to a point where you could graze? Yeah, there's a number of challenges. It's financial uh, challenges, like how do you take that uh, those acres that are uh, prime crop ground and then and take them out of production for a little while while you're getting your prairie established? How do you make that financially viable? It, it's that's a struggle. Uh, um, also, uh, so prior, so the conventional farming system is a often a chemically dependent system so when i was taking that those acres of my farm out of the chemical system and converting it into a like an organic and a, a pasture uh, into a, a system that doesn't use chemicals there's a little uh there's a, a critical time there where like an addict, you go through withdrawal. It, it kind of it doesn't work. This the, this ecosystem doesn't work well. The soil ecosystem it kind of collapses, and so there's there's some difficult times there in the transition process as far as productivity. It isn't as productive. There's a, you get weeds established that you don't want there that are competing with the plants that you want to grow there. So. Uh, so there's some growing pains, but if you push through and it, it'll, it, it, nature has a way of healing itself. Um, so, I, so I, those are some of the big things. And then um, I would say like figuring out uh, different programs that are available to, to help you, but then you have to kind of work with them. So like, Equip program was a big, a big thing for us. It, it helped pay for seeding and fences and water lines. But then, because of that, I didn't have any fences in my farm to start with. So, do I wait until they allow me to build my fences and and get by in the meantime for a couple of years without fences? So we got a few cows, and then we're trying to get by with just some temporary fences until these funds kick in and then allow us to build fences. So there was some struggles there, um, but those programs are, are worthwhile. Um, yeah, so that, that's some of the challenges. So where did you find out about the EQUIP program? Uh, my local NRCS. I, I kind of knew that these things were available through talking with other farmers, you know, at, uh, as we're getting started, some of the networking, some of the conferences you go to, mm -hmm. you hear mention of, oh, I did this, I got, th these funds are available. And if you, then you go talk to your local NRCS office and they, they say, well, here's what we have and here's how you apply. And, you know, it was did a big you, deal for us. That, that's, it's a lot of money that helped us get started. I, I don't think we, yeah, we could have done it without those funds. Sure. So, how did you go about getting your seed for your prairie? Yeah, um, I sourced local ecotype seed. Um, so probably I used maybe four or five different seed companies that I would send them a list of what I wanted and they would say, here's what we have and here are our sources. And then I would put together a big spreadsheet and, and pick and choose which species I wanted for that that had the, the local ecotypes and and then cost is a factor. So I, yeah, I, you know, our mix was probably 110 different species and they were planting uh, uh, according to uh, uh, like 
wet or dry or hillside, you know, hills or you know, in the wetlands or you know, mm -hmm. music you know, prairie. So, you know. so that is an important thing that you mentioned. One is sourcing your seed from a radius of where you're located because native seeds tend to do better if they're locally sourced, right? Yeah. And then understanding and assessing your land and understanding that you can have different soil types even within your own property that you have to think about when you're picking your seed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Another thing I, I considered when I was picking seed is I wanted to find Southern uh, ecotypes because the, the climate is changing. And so, you know, it's said that we're gonna have Iowa's or even Missouri's climate in the not so distant future. So right. I would take that into consideration too. Well, that, that actually is something that most people don't think about. And I know that some of our partners in the DNR and other agencies have been talking a lot about that transition of biomes um, and really looking at Midwest tall grass prairie, like from Kansas and um, that area, moving gradually up this way, probably quicker than we really think it is. And so that is an important consideration. Um, and then also there's the that there's the whole idea of what prairie grasses are better forage for grazing, right? Because not all prairie grasses can be grazed. Yeah, I also uh, put some thought into that, which, which species are more palatable and more productive. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it's amazing. And um, one of the other really beautiful features of your property is uh, the lake that is adjacent to your property. Can you tell us a little bit about the lake and um, are you able to use that lake for irrigation or to water your animals? I No, I don't use it. I mean, they, they'll have access to the lake so they can drink out of it, but I have a well with water lines that equip funded. And then, so I, I have water available, you know, clean water for the, the they pretty much just drink that. They prefer the cleaner, fresh, you know, source of water. Right. As opposed to the lake. But I want my animals to, I want to have in, animal impact on the lake shore. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's not, you know, we, we rotationally graze. So I want some disturbance along the lake shore. So I don't, I don't, you know, I don't want uh, erosion on the, on the banks, but I want uh, some disturbance, like I said, to, so that it doesn't become just solid re-canary for it. So uh, right. grazing is really good for you know, wetlands, but it has to be done done right. Sure. Uh, so this lake, it's a, it's a 900 acre lake, but it I'm a, a water quality or assessor, I, I get a, a volunteer. So I go out and measure the water quality of the lake and it's really bad. It, like you drop the secchi disc down and it disappears in half a foot or a foot, you can't see it. it. The water quality is so poor because it's a shallow lake and there's a lot of runoff uh, around around it. Um, yeah, so yeah, it. I really want it to be better. So we doing our part, you know, having a per, all perennials around. We're, there's really not much erosion happening from my farm anymore like there used to be but so we're holding all our soil back right water as well so do you notice uh since you're doing the water quality test testing do you notice um an improvement at water quality in the winter versus spring and through uh, fall yeah we don't do any water quality testing in the winter it's just a summer activity but I would imagine, yeah, oh, that there, it's there isn't there's no runoff really coming off in the winter, so there's not much sediment getting deposited into the water in the winter. Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, um, as an alum of the University of Minnesota, um, how has your degree and your love of wetlands informed? the relationship you have with the water and the prairie. You've talked a little bit about that, but can you share with us a little bit more about your background and maybe how that's kind of um, motivated you or inspired you to take on this adventure? Yeah, so I, I have my undergrad at University of Minnesota Morris, and I also have 
a master's degree in ecology from South Dakota State. And it through, well, it was really at Morris that I first fell in love with the prairie. I, I volunteered at the US Fish and Wildlife Service office on my senior seminar project. I was doing some prairie stuff and I was out with the wildlife bi biologist doing some uh, uh, inventorying of uh, native prairies. So just, I, she taught me the, all the plants and then I was going around just looking and identifying plant species, native species. So once you once you learn that to identify individual species and that you start, so you recognize that there are you can put a name to all these plants and you come to appreciate that they have a place there that like it's not just like you, they're they become like friends to you it's like, especially the rare ones that like oh it's something really interesting to see and that that they have uh they have a place in the whole system and you learn to see how the, they interact with one another and, and the insects and the birds and it's it all functions as a system and then so and then to see the impacts of agriculture and and how how uh, agriculture is, is kind of degrading the, the prairie and the biodiversity and yeah that that's that's how i came to want to manage prairie in a way that it benefits uh, agriculture. So, so blending, producing food and have prairie and have them both working well together at the same time. That was, that's my goal here at this one. Well, you've kind of uh, segued into my next uh, question a little bit. Um, so now that you've been working on the land and uh, getting it suitable for grazing. Can you talk a little bit? You mentioned um, in the introductory video that we we showed at the beginning that you have cattle and goats. Um, I imagine sometimes your animals change from season to season. But um, can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, you've got a great website that kind of tells the story of how you, you started your place. Um, and it, it talks about you having... Um, animals uh, that you market and sell. Um, once you got to the point where you've got animals that are coming off the land, can you talk about being in rural Minnesota, where you're located, and the type of quality of meat that you're raising, what it was like to find a market for that, and how you do that? Sure. So it's, it's tough to sell to direct market locally, like, uh, there's there's plenty of gardens and uh, local people raising a few head of beef or whatever, and uh, so there isn't much of a market here. We don't we sell a few uh, a few quarters of beef to to uh, our neighbors, but not many. Most of our customers are in the city center, uh, Fargo. The Twin Cities, St. Cloud, mm -hmm. um, but yeah. So, and we when we first got started, we were selling vegetables, and we had a CSA. And we were selling chickens and pigs, and yeah. So we we tried a bunch of that farmers markets. Um, they, they didn't they didn't really pencil out those all the effort to sell at farmers markets. Try to sell locally. That was my. Uh, it's what I wanted to do. I wanted to sell locally, but we just couldn't get enough people and enough. It wasn't worth the time to go to those farmers markets, those local ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for all the effort you put in, you don't get enough in return. So, yeah, so we we don't do any. We we've tried uh, wholesale markets, some restaurants, but that hasn't panned out either. Like the two, we tried a restaurant in in Alec and in Alexandria, and we a restaurant in Morris, and we kind of got uh, like they backed out on something. They so we we made some changes to our operation to accommodate them, and then they then they disappeared, and we were left with all this meat that we had. Yeah, but it it's 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 a struggle to direct market. It, yeah. yeah. I think um, I think it really brings to light that 
there are different ways to uh, raise produce. There's different ways to raise chickens and eggs. There's different ways to raise meat. And sometimes the way we raise those um, products can um, be good with the land or for the land. And sometimes they can be extractionist to the land. And I think, um, you know, if I hear what you're saying, really, if you, if you are doing this with um, the intent that you're building soil and you're protecting water quality, that it means that you're raising your animals differently and you're raising your vegetables and produce differently if you choose to do that. And sometimes that isn't the cheapest or the quickest way. Sometimes it takes more time. Sometimes it's more labor to do it um, in a way that is ecologically sound. Would you agree? Oh, absolutely. So it, it's more work and it's so it costs more. Mm -hmm. uh, and who appreciates that the difference is, I think more the local people don't as much that don't recognize the why our products cost more than at the supermarket. And so more more people, well, they're just more people in, in the cities, but uh, there are more people that recognize that, that that's worth paying for you know, what we have. Right. So how did the people in the cities hear about um, Lakeside Prairie Farm? Uh, well, our website and then the Minnesota Grown the directory uh, there's an eatwild.com has been a good source of customers for us. Um, just word of mouth, your friends and family. Yeah. So how many head of cattle do you guys produce a year? Uh, we're direct marketing about 15 head a year. So right now I've got about 30, well, no, it's more like 22 cows and then i've got some younger animals as well and yeah and uh, all of last year's calves i still have and are you still doing goats oh yeah i i actually i really i like the goats better than the cows i i moving forward i want to concentrate more on goats I, the market is really good right now and ecologically, I just love, well, ecologically, I love what the goat does uh, on our farm, getting rid of uh, buckthorn and, and just how they graze and their, their impact on the land. And, um, and they're easier to handle. Like, I, I, I really like the goats I, more so than the cows. Even, even though the, the cows right now are more profitable, but I think it, moving forward, I think the goats will be more. Goats scare me. <laughs> they eat everything, right? They make me a little nervous. We haven't we haven't gone the route of goats yet, uh, I, and I shouldn't even say yet because it's not. Uh -huh. I, I don't know. Uh, we've had we have um, steers, and we also have uh, um, heirloom hogs that. Yeah. Um, they range in our groves. So, uh, and we don't have a huge number, you know, we have a small piece of property and we do it very small scale, but we also um, do what you do, but on a much smaller scale, I guess. Uh, one of the challenges we've had actually is finding a butcher. Can you talk a little bit about yeah. that? Like, like what it's like for you to try to find someone who can um, uh, work with your customers, your clients and, and get your product do you have to do do you do you butcher over a period of time or do you butcher seasonally how do you do that yeah butchering is uh, that's it's a big hassle especially right now with when after covid hit everybody was <laughs> yep <laughs> people were going to the to the sale barn buying up 30 hogs or whatever and then making appointments with the butcher that they've never they've never done that before. So all the regular farmers who had you know, regular appointments that they, they could no longer get a butcher dates because yeah, all these other people were. So right now butchers are booked out. Some are like almost two years in advance. So animals that aren't even born yet 
or have a butcher deed. And so I, uh, yeah, it's, it's nuts. And luckily I have a local butcher that I have a good relationship with and you know, he squeezes me in from time to time, but yeah, it, uh, <laughs> it's a big problem across the country right now. Every, everybody's hurting for low, small scale butchers. Um, yeah. So one of the things for, for people who might not have ever bought um, their meat from a farm before, from a local grower, um, at least with steers or, or cattle, you can buy them in a quarter, a half, or a whole um, cow at a time and uh, pick them up from the butcher. So like the farmer brings them to the butcher and you work with the butcher to get the cuts and the packaging the way that it works for your family. And um, that would be like uh, one way of getting them. And then some um, producers are also, they work with USDA um, certified butchers that actually will package individual cuts for sale, which is sometimes common, sometimes not common. It just kind of depends on the farm that you're working with. Um, okay. Yeah. And I think, uh, now do you also have people buy your goats or do they go to market? Yeah. I sold my first goats last fall and I just took them to the uh, sale barn. To okay. You know, um, with the regeneration um, of cheeses, artisanal cheeses, uh, there's in rural Minnesota, there's more people raising goats for their milk for cheese production, which I think is interesting. We have a neighbor that's been doing that for about three years now. And I think that that's kind of an interesting also um, idea, a lot more work and a lot more regulation than just raising them for meat. But um, it's, it's nice to know that people are bringing back some of these practices that um, were seemingly lost, uh, you know, in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. So it's kind of uh, interesting to me. Um, you know, you've talked a little bit about that you have a degree, but are you and your wife, Jesse, are you farming full time? I am farming full time. Okay. She's a school teacher. She's okay. So that kind of helps stabilize income on, on your, for your family. Um, you have a couple kids and uh, I love seeing pictures of them out on your farm. Um, as you're farming, like, do you talk to them about what you're doing? Like, do you, do they ask, are they curious or are they oblivious? Oh no, they certainly are aware of what's going on and yeah, oh, they, they both love gardening, being outside. You know, just oh, that, what a great place to raise kids, you know, especially during the pandemic where they could just go out and be kids and not have to be cooped up. And yeah, they, it, they, uh, yeah, they've come to appreciate you point out this bird or that plant and, and, and then, and then the next time they see it, they're like, they recognize it and they, they point that out to you and they remember it. And yeah, it's, it's really neat. Yeah, I, I definitely, that's a big part of what we're about is raising the next generation to appreciate their place in the world, uh, their place, their role in the ecosystem. Yeah, that, that's important to me. We, um, do your kids name the animals? Certainly. <laughs> my kids do too <laughs> can kind of we never tell them which one comes back from the butcher they never know which ones got sold and which ones come back to us but um it is kind of you know interesting conversation sometimes like when you're doing chores and they're complaining about chores mine are teenagers yours not quite at that age yet but um when they're helping out um with chores and things and we have a conversation at the dinner table about you know why we do what we do. And mostly, quite honestly, and I, you know, I, I would have to say we do it for them. Um, you know, we uh, bought our farm late uh, in life. And uh, my husband was raised on a farm, but it was a different type of farming operation. It was a dairy, small dairy in the Marshall area. And 
it was his dream to have a farm and, and raise kids uh, outdoors on a farm and which a lot of people have that dream. And um, to be able to raise our own food, he was always an avid gardener, but just got into animals when we purchased our property. And, um, you know, it takes more work, but it is so much better. And um, I think, like you said, with your kids, if you can teach them about what you're doing, whether it's what you're planting and growing for food, or even just as you're restoring the landscape, and you can talk about why you have birds now that you might not have had before, or um, different prairie plants that are coming up. Um, I love getting my youngest is kind of a prairie hound and you know, we'll be doing something in the house or in the yard and I'll hear this mom, come and check this out. (laughs) And she'll have found something that she recognized from a previous season. So that is kind of exciting. Um, You talked about buying your land. Um, Were you from the Barrett area originally? No, my grandparents were from Morris. Okay. Which is pretty close, but um... You no, know, I grew up in St. Cloud. My wife and I are both from, from St. Cloud. Um, yeah. So you and never my, you never grew up with a farming background then? Yeah, so my grandparents farm. Okay. And so are they still alive today? Yeah, they are. Yeah. So what are the conversations like with you and your grandfather then? <laughs> 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 yeah, um, it, it's really neat to... to because they had cattle and raised crops and to to talk about you know, how he did it and what yeah it it's it's really neat yeah so um i'm wondering if there's any questions in the chat if people had any questions for brian um Here's one. Brian, can you say a little bit more about inputs, like what kinds of inputs are required to raise cattle and uh, I think goats. It says sheep, but I'm thinking you have goats. So, so we'll buy some mineral and then uh, I make most of my hay. I buy a little bit of hay, but what I don't raise. But that's, that's it. Uh, those are the inputs. It's hay. Um, and then, so winter feed is hay, and uh, summer is just you moving them around on pasture. So maintaining fence, but a little fuel for the tractor, and but the, the it, inputs are minimal, and that I think that's really important to be successful in farming is to, to keep your sure. inputs minimal and know where to best put your money so i not investing in infrastructure as well is is important so like we don't have any buildings you know barns or like infrastructure our infrastructure is really minimal uh we have water lines and fences that's it like that's it and our cattle are outside our goats we have some calf huts that they winter in and they as long as you've got good bedding for them, they, they're fine, uh, even through the coldest part of winter. So, yeah, I think keeping your inputs low is, is important in, to be successful farming. I also would have to say that, uh, how do you manage the wind? Because I know it's windy where you're at, because I heard it on that introductory video. <laughs> and wind can play an important, like, it can be an, a challenge raising animals in the winter, particularly. Um, do your animals have shelter or do you have wind breaks or? That's, that is important. To, yeah. If you don't have uh, buildings, then to have a wind break. Then we have trees and so we've got a good uh, wind, wind protection for them. Yeah. Okay. You said that you uh, raise your own hay. So do you... Um, harvest the grasses on your native prairie or do you actually plant a pasture that you harvest for winter feed yeah we've got 20 acres of that i have that i i have in uh, a grass alfalfa mix so okay. it's not native but um that i hate and then i i've rent um uh, i've 
cut hay on some DNR land as well. It's okay. really, it's really tough making hay on that uh, because of the gopher mounds. But I cut hay for a number of years on that, um, and I rent a small acreage to, for uh, hay off the farm as well. Um, So one of the questions in the chat comes from Troy, University of Minnesota Morris, and he wants to know, where do you want to go next? Like, what, um, is there something with your land uh, or your operation that you want to try that you haven't tried yet? Or something that you're excited about that you want to try? Yeah, the, the goats, like I mentioned a little bit, I want to ramp my goat herd up and, and, uh, so my these goats are kind of a brush goat. They're Spanish goats, and so they're they're hardy and they're good at uh, removing buckthorn and eating things that I don't necessarily want. So like thistles or um, the under undesirable species, uh, they're that's what they're they're good at. And taking so taking my goats and. Uh, and grazing on other to get rid of people's buckthorn that's that's an enterprise that i'm i did a little bit of that last summer and i think i'm going to expand on that um, to move my goats around to other people's uh, problem areas yeah. you know i even saw the dnr using small goat herds at lacapara state park uh, to manage um, some different invasive challenges that they have um, is there, um, are these, this breed of goat, is it a good meat goat? And where, what's your market for that? Like, how do you find that market? So I just took my, my goat, my weathers, the boy, the castrated uh, male goats that I had, that were born last spring. I took them to the sale barn in Pipestone last fall. That was the first goats I've sold. I've just been increasing my herd. I keep, I'm keeping all the, the nannies and, yeah, I was really happy that because of the drought in Australia, that's where a lot of the goats that are imported come from mm -hmm. uh, because of the drought there and the fires and the, the goat market is really, really good right now. And I think uh, that there is also a, a good market for the, the kind of goats that I, I'm raising that are good that for the other people that are trying to bring their goats around and do goat uh, grazing goat management so mm -hmm. to sell to those folks is also a, a good uh, potential market wow uh who would have thought uh, it's too bad though that you know i think pipestone they ship their goats out all over don't they like i, I have some friends in the westbrook area and they raise goats and um there's a market i think in marshall um locally for some of their goats but they were shipping theirs out to indiana or somewhere out further east um and i don't know if it was by truck or by rail but um it, it is a, a bigger footprint than maybe our cattle that we raise um around here but that's really exciting and i do see and hear more and more people using goats for invasive management um both on private lands as well as public lands. Um, somebody noted in the chat that Big Stone Wildlife Refuge also had some goats that they were using, I imagine for sumac or uh, buckthorn. Um, so that's really, that is kind of a niche that, um, you know, that I, I wouldn't have thought of. So that's kind of exciting for you. Um, to point out that prairie and savanna are grazing obligate ecosystems they, they have to have grazers in order to function the, uh, properly right and we so all the dnr land the fish and wildlife land there there are no grazers there's a few deer but like we've removed the grazers from that ecosystem and now they cease to function as prairie as savannah so we have to restore those grazing animals in order for them to for all the birds and and the insects that they want to be there. And for, in order for them to be there, there has to be grazers. So. Right. For the disturbance. And, you know, it's a better solution. You know, for many years, uh, state agencies have been relying 
both forestry and DNR wildlife management have been relying on burning. But, you know, when you think about climate and the impact of climate, burning is one option, but uh, grazing definitely um, has a lot of uh, benefits that are much more friendly to the ecosystem, I think. And, um, you know, I love seeing more and more animals back on the land. We're in Renville County, and I think there's like a handful of people actually grazing animals, um, but it's more than we're there 10 years ago. And so even as you drive uh, the corridor from like Renville to the, you know, Barrett area, um, Elbow Lake area, we're seeing more and more people uh, diversifying their crops, which is improving water quality. And we see more animals, um, you know, on the land, maybe not as many as we'd like, but we are seeing more. Um, so I think that that's good. Mm -hmm. um, so Brian, if you could tell us, uh, what would be your legacy that you want to leave? Um, you know, some people in the series have been on land that has been in their family uh, for multiple generations. Um, this land is new to you. So you're really starting your own legacy. Um, you're not like continuing someone else's legacy in the sense that this land is new to you and Jesse. What do you want your legacy to be for your kiddos? Um, well, I, I consider myself just a steward and of this land. I don't. I'm, I just have it for. I'm. I, it's caretaker for just a, a brief moment in time, and I want to see it, it, it kind of uh, improved. I want to see it back to its former glory. And that that while I was here and in and, and taking care of it, that it I'm passing it on in, in a better state and in, in, in a in a state that it'll it'll continue to function as it should. Um, mm -hmm. And that is, you know, whether or not it's my kids, I which it doesn't that's not important to me. The tra the transition to my kids is as long as somebody else takes takes it up and and cares for for it in the future um so that when we got started we, we had some very generous folks that got us in, you know, onto this farm and i just want to make sure that i pay it forward their generosity pay it forward to the to somebody else um, sure Wow, that is, you know, a different way of looking at it. And I really appreciate the whole idea about being stewards, because that's how we certainly feel about where we're at as well, is that, you know, it might seem like a big chunk of time in our lifetime, but relative to the land and the ecosystem, it's just a small little nugget of time. And I think we have the opportunity to really create curiosity with our neighbors, um, and uh, it's interesting because there's a generation that we see that drive by our farm just so they can see the animals grazing on the pasture because that's what they remember as children. And it's not really something that is around our area a lot. And so um, we know that what we're doing is, is, um, is not only good for us, but good for the next generation and and that is important so i really appreciate you also feeling that same way because i think it's going to take a lot of us to really maybe um have that mindset to make a difference for where we go uh ecologically because um we're seeing so much impact with climate we're seeing what a monocrop culture does to the land and the water and um you know I love seeing more people doing cover crops out there. I love seeing animals out on the land. And so I think the more of us that are out there and doing things differently, and that's really what this series is about, is, is lifting up people and how they're doing this differently and what they're thinking about. Because I think there's common threads through all of the folks that um, are in this series that we're lifting up about caring for ecosystems. So I just want to thank you and uh, Jesse um, for the work that you're doing up there. And thank you for being part of the series and joining us today. Um, 
it's been a pleasure to have you and learn more about your operation and your farm, Brian. Um, I also need to lift up a few other folks um, and partners in this work. Um, Troy Goodno in the Office of Sustainability at the University of Minnesota Morris campus. Judy Johnson, Johnston at um, the Stevens County Soil and Water Conservation District. Brian DeVore and Robin Moore from Land Stewardship Project. Um, Brian helped us with the videoing of the video clips that we show at the beginning. And then the Regional Sustainable Development Partnerships at the University of Minnesota Extensions Program helped us with some funding for this. Um, thank you for joining us today, everyone who is on today. And um, our next um, video is gonna be on Tuesday, March 30th, again at noon. And we'll hear from Jessica Blair uh, on Fire Rock Farm near Starbuck, Minnesota. Remember that these uh, webinars will be available um, on the CURE YouTube page or YouTube channel. You can probably find it on our website too. And you can share these with your friends and your neighbors. Um, our first video with Abby um, Dikut, she uh, is there. So if you missed that webinar, you can go see that one again. And I just wanna thank you. Um, it's been a great opportunity to visit with you, Brian. And thanks for those who joined us today. And have a great rest of your day. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.